Hello there. I have still been hard at work with the HP 9836C that I got recently. Uh, this computer is just absolutely fantastic and I'm having the most fun uh, just learning how to use it and figuring stuff out about it. Primarily, I've recently been looking at the disc images that the HP Museum made uh, and trying to convert them from the uh, very unique TD0 files into much more sane actual disc images. I'm going to have a video about this soon, but it's not quite ready yet. I need a little more time to finish stuff up. But as a teaser, here is uh, CPM 68K running on the HP from an internal five and a quarter inch disc, something that they claim is not possible with the disc images they have. But that is not what today is about. Today, I kind of want to fess up that I've been getting much more interested into the hardware side of this machine and its ecosystem. And uh, one of the things with that is rather obvious because you see the 9122C that I did a video about here, but under it is an 82901M. Now that is a five and a quarter inch drive that is effectively identical to the two internal drives here. I just wanted it to help with this stuff, which it didn't end up helping out all that much with, but uh, now I have it now, and it will actually be useful for my HP Series 80 stuff as well, so I don't feel too bad. For now though, I want to talk about this. This is the HP 2671G. Now in the video where I introduced the computer itself, I mentioned that the cooling on top of the monitor wasn't important because there is a printer that is designed to go up there, and this is it. Now. This printer is cool for a bunch of reasons, and I'm really excited I was able to get one, in particular, the G model here. One of the coolest features is that it will never need ink. But before we can check out any of its cool features, it's going to need to be repaired first. Now before we get into the repairs, let me talk about what this printer is a bit first so you can understand what we're repairing and why. This is an HP 2671G. This printer is the middle of a three-tiered product line of printers to go with the HP Series 200 computers. The 71A was a text-only version of the printer that, in my opinion, shouldn't have really existed, and I'll get to why in a bit. The 71G here is capable of printing both text and graphics, which makes it dramatically better for a graphic-focused computer. Now there was also a 73G, but the 73G really only added a couple of software features, some different fonts, text positioning, and other quality of life things that you could probably get with a decent word processor on this system, which did exist. So the 71G here is the sweet spot printer to get all of the features you could want without totally breaking the bank. As much as you could say that with anything in an ecosystem that costs as much as everything here does. Now being from HP's high-end computer line, it should come as no surprise, this is an HPIB printer. I will mess up and call it HP, but numerous times throughout this video, I am sure. And this means that it can be connected with all manner of other peripherals like the disk drives that I showed or the plotter that I've also featured in another video because HPIB is just the best interface ever. Now, none of those reasons I pointed out are why I really wanted this thing. That has to do more with why it looks so plain and boring. If I take out another printer from this time here, this one is also an HP GPIB printer, you can see just how different these two are. This one here has a whole mechanical thing going on. It's got a ribbon installed. We've got some sprockets for feeding the paper through. And this one, well, it has none of that. The 2671G has nothing that you're intended to service inside. Matter of fact, the only thing you can remove is this. And this goes into why this thing is so awesome and is what I think the ideal vintage printer to use with old computers because it is a thermal printer. You take a roll of thermal paper like this, put it on the spindle, drop it into the machine, feed it in, and then it goes. No ink, no mess. 
It's super easy and simple to use and this paper is still being made today and dirt cheap. Now, if you're not familiar with thermal paper, let me give you a quick demonstration here. This is a plastic spudger. It is not a pencil. It doesn't leave any marks or anything. But if I take this and I swipe on the thermal roll, you'll see it leaves a black mark because the friction heated up the surface of the paper and made it show black. That is how this paper works. It does mean if you leave it in your car on a hot day, the whole thing may turn black, but that is a price that I'm willing to pay for something that is uh, admittedly more of a novelty nowadays. But that is the thermal print head, and with that, all you need is this kind of paper and you can print without having to deal with anything else. Or so I wish, because this has the curse of all the other HP soft rubber materials I've seen, and the belt that drives the thermal print head has decomposed, and I'm sure if I plugged this thing in, it would completely disintegrate. And this is where the repairs come into play, because I think I have found the correct size belt, which if you're watching this video, it probably was, that I'll go ahead and link in the description for all other, what, five people who have one of these printers, so that you can get them repaired as well, because that is systemic. It's even a problem on my HP 85, which I went ahead and also ordered more belts for, so I can fix that at some point now. But today, we're going to take this thing apart and get this one going again because um, I'm just so infatuated with that HP 9836C. But let's get this thing torn apart so we can see that belt a little bit better now. So let's get this open. I put down a nice soft surface here because we have to flip it over first to see the directions on how you actually get this thing open. Now this warning is slightly confusing here, but you do actually turn it upside down, then unscrew everything on the bottom, then flip it over and release the top. The screws themselves are actually retained because HP is just the king of over-engineering everything. Also on the bottom here, we can see this one was made in May of 1983. Really cool to see that on here. Very, very easy to work on. Now to get some more room to access the belt, I'm gonna pull this up to lift the faceplate forward, unplug this connector, and then the whole thing pulls away. Now that it's open, there are a number of weird and interesting things that we can see in here. Firstly is that it's just so empty. Uh, they really didn't need a lot of space in here. I'm guessing they added length so it would fit cleanly on top of the monitor. That's about the only reason I can see. Uh, partially because this piece right here is the crux of the printer and was actually sold as a standalone module. You could just buy this and then it interfaces with a connector right here to the logic board that is what gives this the HPIB interface. Another thing we can see is that monster cap right there. Uh, looking at the power supply board, that is a screw terminal cap, so we will be removing that and reforming it here immediately uh, so we can get that started uh, because that sucker is enormous. Uh, I can't quite make out what it is. I'm guessing the writing's on the back, but it looks like a Sprog Compulytic, so it's going to be a big one. But we can also see up front here the main event, but I really do want to get that cap reforming, so let me get that out first. All right, looks like we have a Powerlytic by Sprog, 14,000 microfarad, 50 volt cap. Yeah, that is uh, definitely the kind of thing that is worth reforming. And what's really nice about these screw terminal kinds is that I can just plug banana jacks straight into them. They are very easy and quick to do. All right, I've got all the gear set up, power supplies running, multimeters running for my GPIB cap reforming. Gonna plug in the positive side and the negative side there. And we can now go get that started. 
And since everyone feels the need to constantly criticize reforming capacitors, here's a Mauser search for 14,000 microfarad caps in a wide range of voltages, starting at the minimum for that. There were three of them in stock, and only one of them was even close to the right dimensions. Uh, even still, that cap over there is 35 millimeters. This one is 50, so it wouldn't even fit. And that is a $45 capacitor. So yeah, we're going to reform this sucker. All right, that capacitor is on its way to being a healthy cap again. So we'll leave that be for a while and let the software go ahead and bring up the voltage nice and slow. And if you want to know more about this whole process here, uh, I'll link a video I made that goes into significant detail about it in the description below. All right, now that that's being taken care of in the background, we can turn our attention back to this and this horrific, ugly belt. Now, the HP Museum does have some information about the belt that this thing needs on their site, but uh, I luck out a lot, and we can just barely make out 310T80 on here. And what that means is that this is a 310 tooth belt with an 80 mil tooth spacing. Getting in close here, you can also see just how badly this original one is decaying. The individual strands inside are falling apart, and the rubber coating has just turned into a brown, fragile, hard substance, really. I was going to say goo, but no, it's completely dried out. So uh, if I tried to power this thing on, it would just shed this all over into the mechanism, and I don't really want to do that. Probably would have hurt that cap anyway, so it's a good thing all around to inspect stuff like this first. So let's try and figure out how to get that thing off safely now. Looking it over here, I have a couple of ideas of how to approach this, but uh, because I've never done it before, I'm going to let the camera roll as I just work on it a bit, and then I will document the steps in reverse as we reassemble it with the new belt. <laughs> Okay, I'm pretty happy with how clean this is now. So let's get an answer for the belt. Is the one I ordered a good replacement or not? Let's do this really quick. Here is the original horrible one. And oh, that, that seems dead on to me. Uh, so, all right, I'm looking forward to trying to get this in there. Just getting the belt in there is fairly easy. Um, I want to see if it will fit right now. The first thing I'm going to need to do is pinch one end and feed it under there. And then I will do the same on the other side. Then I can feed this up to the top then put this roller in like this and push it into these channels here that hold it in place. Okay. I can pull it over here and then this is the stepper so what i'm going to do is put it on the edge right there and then push this up and in and that will absolutely totally work so i can pull the stepper motor farther off to the left here to add more tension um, that it has uh, slots for the mount it's not fixed so that'll work uh, and yeah i think that that's gonna be it, that feels perfect. Okay, Whew. those are the right belts, awesome. Okay, let's go ahead and get this reassembled for real. Uh, the first step is going to be getting the belt pinched 
under the uh, head clamp here. And I noticed while I was cleaning this that there's actually a groove here that I think the bell, uh, head rests on. So I don't think it's possible to misalign it, or at least you can get it locked in place pretty easily. I also noticed there's this rubber coated wheel down here. It looks like it should have an O-ring on it. I do not have an O-ring this size to replace it, but it is not in very good condition, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think this will matter too much because I think it just rolls along uh, here inside of that. So it's not super critical. Uh, but yeah, if I'd known that uh, maybe, let me get a caliper measurement actually. It looks like a half inch O-ring. Yeah, so uh, that would be what you'd need to replace that I suspect. So I'm going to get the belt up top here. And also for the record, uh, that is definitely the correct pitch. It locks in very nicely on that. I'm gonna just kind of work on this until I get it in there. But yeah, you need to get the belt under the clip and then have the head flat. So yeah, there's uh, several things manage here once. All right, there, yeah. Um, I'm gonna definitely recommend just taping the head down <laughs> to this when you go to reinstall it. That made it a lot easier. Um, but that, will be all I need to get the uh, carriage reassembled here. Okay, now that the carriage is mostly ready, uh, the linear rail that holds it in place is what goes here next. I'm just gonna wipe this off while it's out and accessible. This thing mounts kind of weird. Um, it has holes in the end that are tapped so you can put in these screws and then the, it just rests in to the uh, ends like that and then the screws pinch it from the side, so it doesn't actually go through. I've not seen that before. Uh, so what this means actually is that you have to put the uh, head on here first and then to uh, secure it, uh, there is an O-ring that goes on uh, and then a C-clip. And when you disassemble this, you'll have to take the C-clip off to slide the head out. So put that on now, that's locked in, it can't fall off of the linear rail. So one end goes over there and then the other end I have to press on this slightly. Let's make sure I don't ruin my ribbon cable here. Uh, press on this slide out just a little bit and now the linear rail is in position but that's not it. Uh, now it needs to be screwed into the ends. All right, there we go. Now that the linear rail is in, uh, I'm gonna just walk through how this should be put together. Ribbon goes behind this plastic. This wheel goes in this channel there, which moves the print head away from the thermal barrier on the back uh, for the print head so it doesn't like melt the plastic. So uh, this should move freely uh, side to side. And if you're at that point, you're good. Now, I'm gonna push the belt through on both sides and make sure the top side goes along the top. And then on the other side, do the same. Okay. Top side up to the top. Okay. All right, then on the right side, in order to get the belt in or out, uh, this pulley has to come out. Uh, so it'll go under the belt there. And then that gets held up against everything on the inside. So that absolutely must come out. Uh, then we get to the fun part on the other side where we actually tension the belt uh, for real. So I'm gonna pull it through over here and I'm gonna keep a little bit of pressure on it. And I'm going to grab one nut here and then I'm going to put the belt onto the uh, pulley over here and then pull the stepper motor up and I'm gonna put one nut on there and then another one here. And for the most part, that is it. There's a, that is the mechanism reassembled. Oh yeah. All right, it should work. Uh, the last thing you have to do is put this motor back on which mounts here and there, down in there. Um, this is what actually drives the paper. Okay, but while I have that open, I'm gonna bring the vacuum up here and uh, I'm gonna clean this all out a bit more and uh, just look over a bunch of stuff. There's little bits everywhere. Uh, just trying to get the whole thing as clean as possible. 
Uh, one last thing is that uh, I did have to remove the power supply board to get access to the uh, other side where that pulley is. Um, it's just a couple of connectors. It's actually really easy to remove. It's pretty well designed overall. Yeah, I will check back in with you after cleaning this up a bit and once that bad boy is ready to be put back in. Uh, one last thing I forgot about here, this clear paper guide, which is really gross. One moment. Much better looking now. This actually slides under this piece. Uh, you can put this on or take it off at any time here. Uh, there are two slots that it goes into and it kind of uh, guides itself in. It rolls as it goes down in. Uh, so it's pretty easy to do. You don't have to worry about uh, that being an issue. And with that beep, the cap is reformed. Okay. All right. Uh, we are close to firing this thing up for the first time and I have no idea if it works. So I am quite excited to find out here. Uh, it should be pretty easy. I was looking at the operator's manual while the capacitor was reforming to know what I would need to do. Let's uh, get this threaded here. And now that that's tightened down, I can uh, show you this. Uh, on the front panel, there's just a, a test button. So this should be pretty easy. I'm gonna get the front panel plugged back in here. Might as well snap it in place. There we are. And that should be it. Let me grab a roll of paper. Okay, I haven't actually uh, attempted fully loading this in here yet, so. Uh, the manual made it seem like it's really easy. Out. Okay. Yeah, okay, I now understand this. There's the clear part. Uh, it will be over that. So we're just gonna kinda take the paper, pinch it onto the clear part, and then drop that down, and that's loaded. Okay. So, let's... Let's do this. This is off. I am plugging it in. And I am turning it on. Okay. I'm going to guess that was it homing. Let's try this again. That seems pretty good. I'm going to do a form feed. Uh, hmm. Well, let's run. I'm going to press the test button. I'm going to see what it does. All right, it prints, but it's not advancing the paper. Why? Oh, because I didn't plug the paper advance motor back in. Hey, okay, easy enough. I also didn't tighten this down. Uh, let me pull on this really quick and uh, do that. All right, tore it off to a clean portion. Speed it up just a little bit so we can see, and now it should pass its self-test. Oh, yes. Oh, it's perfect. And that means I have no reason not to finish putting it together. There are a couple of things I could clean up here, but uh, I'll do that once it's all reassembled. All right, I am very, very happy with how this thing uh, is looking now. There were actually a couple of printers um, when I was looking for one, and I picked this one in particular because I thought it looked the best, and it, it does look pretty good. So let's go use it with the computer now. All right, everything is set up and ready to go. We've got the printer here, and uh, we're gonna try it out. Now, I've uh, put a couple of programs on different floppy disks here for us to test this with, and uh, I have several objectives that I want to do. Uh, the first thing, though, I need to mention is 
the kind of paper that I'm using in here. This is a box of Staples thermal fax paper rolls. That's what I installed in there. And uh, funny story, uh, turns out, uh, I was looking at this, this box is actually from 2002, which means this box is now as old as that printer was when this was made. <laughs> so that's a little funny. But uh, something I've noticed with this is that this paper doesn't tear at all. I've actually had to use an X-Acto knife to try and cut the paper to get it out of the printer when I needed to do that. Now, if we look at the HP 85 with its original paper installed, I can easily take the paper from the printer and just tear it off at the plastic edge. Looking closer at it, I think the HP paper has bigger, larger, looser fibers than the much more tightly made fax paper. So I'm guessing this was intended to be cut somehow in a fax machine. I don't actually have a fax, so I'm not familiar with that, but I could totally see it having like a, a knife that drags across the paper to cut it. So I'm guessing that's how that works. But all that is to say, if I mess up something in the video, I'm not going to attempt to cut the paper and hide the mistake. You're just gonna see it. Uh, normally it's better to hide the little issues for continuity, but uh, it is very, very difficult to cut the paper on this, it turns out. But that's enough explanation of what's gonna go on here. Let's print some stuff. And it's very easy to do with the HP computers, which is just a lot of fun. So I've actually created an auto start file for this machine. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and have it print it to the display here. And uh, we can now see all the lines of my startup script. And I can press one button to have this be printed, or at least this page. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a different way to print out the whole project listing, but it's basically one page, so this will work fine. I'm gonna hold shift and I'm gonna press dump alpha, which will just send it straight to the printer. And there we are. That is the program that I've been using to auto start this machine recently. And yeah, turns out it has beep codes. <laughs> so I've been using that as my boot up chime. Now, the other cool thing about this is that it isn't just text that it can do this with. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the examples disc here and we're gonna load a more interesting example than I showed last time. What I wanted to load here is the demo called Mech. So let me do that. All right, now I'm gonna run it. And this is a, a really cool demo actually. It's just taunting me with not being able to find a cat application for this. Ah but we can print this display straight to the plotter in exactly the same way as the text. You can hold shift and then press a key for dump graphics. So here's what that looks like. That is pretty darn awesome there. Uh, one thing I'm not so sure about after having used this a bit is uh, I was wondering if this would support HPGL and I'm now thinking no. Uh, so I suspect this is a raster graphics uh, from the frame buffer from the display. Uh, which is still really cool and it's good to know that it will do things like uh, change all of the color to monochrome to print onto here because there are a lot of different colors on the display and it's just black and white on the thermal printer of course. So uh, I'm glad to see that but everything also just looks absolutely phenomenal. That print quality is great on there. Uh, very nice and sharp. So we can print text and we can print graphics extremely easily but we're doing that by doing screen printing. And that's not quite how you would want to do something like this. So let's load something more real. This 
is a disc that I have put WordWise onto. This is an actual word processor for the HP Series 200 computer. And with this, we can create a formatted printout with headers and footers and underlines and bold and all that kind of fun stuff to work with this printer. Although there are actually issues with it. So I was reading in the manual here, uh, there are compatibility issues with this software noted for different printers. So I actually have this one, the ThinkJet uh, 2225A and the 2671G here. Uh, so this printer will apparently not do bold or underlining just because the head cannot move back spaced uh, while printing. So the way the software is expecting it to work is for bold, let's say, you'll print one character, which would then move the head forward. Then it wants to half step back so that it would have two slightly overlapped characters, print again, and then move forward. This may do the micro stepping, probably because it does graphics, but it doesn't do the back positioning, which is a little weird, I feel, but uh, oh well. It's a shame that the uh, word processing software can't just rasterize the text to do this, but it probably shares a text backend with dot matrix printers as well. But enough of what it can't do, let's see what it can do. And we'll hit run to start the software. Now, like I mentioned, this is a full proper word processor. So here it's actually asking for the page dimensions and margins that we want to set. But while we're here, I wanna see if I can do something because the software actually overrides a lot of the keys on the keyboard. Uh, this software has displayed text through the alpha memory, but also through the graphics memory. And I want to demonstrate something here that I have not yet found a way of working around. If I hold shift and press dump graphics, all right, it's printing out the extremely fancy uh, stuff for the WordWise 2 thing, but you'll notice it did not print any of the text. I can also do shift dump alpha, and then it will print all of that text to the printer, but it doesn't have any graphics. Now there is a button here for print all. I don't know quite what that's going to do, but uh, I kind of want to find out. So I'm going to go ahead and try do a uh, dump graphics here and see if it prints both. I'm not actually sure. That would be a no. So that is a limitation of this when you're just doing screen printing and why having a proper program to interface with this would be beneficial. So let's go ahead and continue into this. All right, so I may now start typing my text. And uh, this is different from say, just loading the basic editor um, because it does proper formatting, word wraps, new paragraphs and all those kinds of things. So for right now, we're gonna keep it simple. And I'm just gonna write a bit of text on here to demonstrate the line wrapping and new paragraphs. Okay, I've written something that is more than a single screen's worth now. I think it says it's 21 lines. Well, I guess that would technically fit on a single screen, but the way that it shows it on here, it doesn't. Uh, and I have a little bit of formatting, some indentations. We'll see how that goes. I'm not exactly sure how it works on here, but that should do something. So if I remember correctly, I'm gonna press Control IO here, and then I'm gonna press E to tell it I want it to go to the external printer, and now we'll see how it handles it. That is uh, very annoying, it had to get that form feed in there. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is release the roll and just uh, bring it back <laughs> so we can see it a little easier here. There we are. And uh, yeah, that worked out really well actually. It's uh, kind of awesome to have an actual word processor on this thing. So uh, that's really cool. It worked out, uh, I'm happy with that. Well, I'm gonna show you one more dumb use case here uh, with a different program. Uh, so I'm going to pop in this disc, which contains games. Always fun there. 
Now, one thing I did not demonstrate previously is that I could just press in a single edit button and bring up a text editor here. Um, and I really didn't showcase the wheel either, which is awesome, by the way. Um, so yeah, you can go through your basic program like this really easily uh, to find stuff. It is very, very impressive. Uh, and then I'm just gonna hit continue, break out of it, uh, and then run to actually start it here. And unsurprisingly, it's breakout. And uh, really cool, it starts out with a demo that just shows it running on its own. <laughs> but we're going to uh, play this ourselves here. I'm gonna set it to easy with nine rows and turn on the trail. So this is played with the wheel actually, and it is ridiculously responsive. Like this, this computer has no reason being this good at this. Come on, I just want a good run. Give me one. Oh, there we go. All right, so what I can do here is press dump graphics. Boom. And I get a screenshot of my game. not a feature I would have initially expected to have with this system. It's obviously not exactly meant for games, but this just shows you how this can be useful. Say you're actually using this for real work, like watching a measurement in real time that you're plotting from an oscilloscope or something. You can print out when you see something really worth noting uh, on the fly instantly and uh, have a physical copy of it. This is easier than trying to write it to a bitmap on a disk or something and then reload it later because it's just right there. So this is a really handy add-on to have for this computer. Well, that is the 2671G thermal printer for the HP Series 200 computer. I'm really happy I picked that thing up to go along with it. That is so much fun to be able to have that to go with this machine. It is uh, far from the last peripheral we'll be taking a look at for this thing. Uh, so it's going to be even more fun as time goes on. But uh, yeah, that was a pretty big one to get in my book. Obviously, I could do a lot of that stuff with other printers. But now that I think about it, especially something like the game there, I don't think I had anything that could do raster graphics for this thing. So that really was a good addition that gives me more capabilities with this computer. Is that capability I need and will make use of? Probably not, it's an old computer. But if there was any computer I was actually going to try and write software to use with my test equipment, it would be this one. So there is a chance that we'll try and do some work with this thing for real in the future. But for now, that's it. If you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe to be notified when I release another one. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time. I have one more idea for something I could print out with this. Let's see if I can make that work.